Lord Jesus, we have sung of your death, the power in your death to forgive sinners, the power in your death to satisfy righteous demands for justice, the power in your death to defeat the evil one. And then we have sung of your resurrection, your power over the grave, your power over death itself. We are so thankful to be found in you. We know that our life is one lived as an echo of your suffering. You have called your disciples to take up crosses, to deny themselves and to follow you. We recognize, Lord Jesus, that the Christian life, the life of discipleship, is a life of self-emptying, a life of cost, a life of loss. And yet the losses cannot be compared to the infinite gain for us to lose the whole world and gain the soul can't even be compared to what it would be like to gain the world and lose you. So we thank you that you have placed our hopes, our anticipation, our joy. You have hidden our life and you have declared our citizenship outside of this world at home in heaven with you. We pray that these would be our thoughts, that you would use your word even this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit to make us homesick for our permanent residence, to recalibrate our affections, to cause us to center our priorities on those things that last forever. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation. We'll continue our study this morning in Revelation chapter 6. And this is, as you know, a book about Jesus Christ. It is so good for us to be here. Even though the pages we look at in these scenes, really from chapter 6 through chapter 19, are doom and gloom. Uh, They are doom and gloom in the plan of God that brings about his glory and his people's good. Martin Luther, in his memorable song, the anthem we often sing, closed this way, Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. Does your heart resonate with that song? Is it so easy to let goods go? Is it so easy to let kindred go? How can Martin Luther sing such a thing? (laughs) You think about your own possessions, you think about relationships, you think about plans that you have, you think about prizes. It's actually difficult to lose that white knuckle grip on temporal realities. What does your heart do when they go away? How does your mind respond when relationships fizzle or things rust or thieves break in and steal? How does your heart respond to God? How does your heart respond to your circumstances? when things fall apart in a cursed and broken world? How does your heart respond when injustices are done? It's one thing to live in a world that falls apart. It's another yet to live in a world where people with malice do unjust things, cause irreparable harm, take things that can't be replaced. This is the world we live in. Does your heart sing this morning with Martin Luther? Let goods go. Let kindred go. Let this mortal life go too. Do you sing that song when you walk into every next doctor's appointment? Let this mortal life go. I'm one appointment closer to home. 
Sometimes we sing these soaring lyrics with half a heart. My hope this morning is the text we look at this morning will fill our heart with these thoughts. Though it describes a people of a future era, it has very much to do with us. As we work through the details of Revelation 6, 9 to 11 this morning, I want you to begin even now to allow this text to probe your heart. See, there's a tremendous advantage to looking into the future, particularly into this future. It gives us practical ground for living. You may have heard the phrase, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. If your head's in the clouds and you're thinking about the future all the time, you can't pay attention to where you're walking. I would suggest that sentiment is as far off course as could be. You are no earthly good until you have counted the weight of eternity over and against temporal things. You are no earthly good until you see every human that you meet with as immortal, that is, as lasting forever either under the wrath of God or in eternal bliss. I would suggest you're unprepared for every next step of your earthly existence until you have cultivated a longing for your heavenly home. I think an eternal perspective is the most practical thing you could have. I believe the text we're looking at this morning should serve to reorient our hearts to recalibrate our thinking to what truly matters and reset our priorities. Read with me Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the Word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe. And they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow slaves and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would also have been completed." Martyrdom is the subject of this seal judgment. It's arresting. The thought of somebody living faithfully to Christ, living for what is good, and being killed for it. Hardly is there a more unjust act than someone murdering someone for bringing good news to them. And yet those who are martyrs in their prosecutable fidelity to Christ become like their master. That is the topic of this scene. These depicted here are a gathering of souls in heaven. They are the souls of ones who have been killed for their testimony of Christ. They are tribulation martyrs. That is, these are those who have died during the opening of these seal judgments, who have died particularly because of the Word of God and the testimony of Christ. The word martyr in our day has been hijacked. The Greek word is simply martyr, and and originally it meant simply a witness, someone who gave a serious testimony to some truth, something they had seen, something they had experienced. And shortly after the New Testament era, in a period of church history where many followers of Christ were killed expressly because they were followers of Christ, that Greek word martyr came to refer to those who testified of Christ at the cost of their own lives. And that has been the fundamental definition of the word down to our day. Now today, some people use the word martyr to describe someone whose reputation takes a hit for some cause. Or in the world of Islamic Jihad, a a martyr is someone who straps a bomb to himself and takes out as many others as he can. But martyr properly is one who is a testifier of Christ. And the martyrs in this passage are those who testified even unto death. 
These are the souls of believers in Jesus Christ who will be murdered for their fidelity to him. In this scene, we'll see these martyrs of the tribulation, and we're going to look at at four realities that they face. And as we do this, we'll we'll make our way through the the four realities of these martyrs fairly quickly, and then we're going to go back through the, the same text looking at our own our own lives. Look at verse 9. We, we find out, first of all, that these martyrs are home. We read here, the lamb broke the fifth seal. The lamb broke the fifth seal. Uh, there are seal judgments. These first seven judgments, uh, they are sealed up with scroll And as the scroll unfolds, each successive seal is broken, and the events behind that seal are unleashed on the world. These are all judgments from God. And those first uh, four seals we looked at were riders on four horses. There's no rider on another colored horse in seal five. The fifth seal judgment is a look into the throne room of heaven, and it is a view of souls. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. We noticed, first of all, that they are in heaven. They are in heaven with God, with Christ. In other words, they are home. And they are described here as souls. That is, they are bodiless, they are immaterial, What appears here in this scene are the immaterial persons. They have no body yet. They they will not get a body until Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. You can turn there. We see this same group. There are thrones. They sat on them. Judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. There's the same description with the same phrases. They had not worshipped the beast or his image. They had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now that doesn't take place until after all of the judgments are finished and Christ comes to the earth in Revelation 19. At that point, they experience a resurrection and their immaterial souls are joined to glorified, eternal, physical bodies. And in those physical bodies, they will reign on the earth with Christ. But here, back in Revelation chapter 6, they are bodiless. They are souls said to be under the altar. And these are not church-era saints They receive new bodies at the resurrection event described in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that rapture and resurrection event that precedes the events of the day of the Lord. This is a group of people who have come to know Christ and then been persecuted for Christ and killed for Christ in a very short period of time. Notice what the text says, they had been slain. Uh, And the word there is the brutal word describing the slaughter of animals. And notice why they were slain. Why were they slaughtered this way? Because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. It's an interesting thing. The, The word of God contains truth and light and life and love. How how could something so good be a cause for mass murder? And the truth is, the Word of God is an offense to those who do not love God. That has always been true. That is true in our day. It will certainly be true in the days of the tribulation. A world in rebellion against God does not come to the light. It hates the light. And notice their slaughter was because of the testimony which they had maintained. The word testimony there is the Greek word for martyr. Uh, This is the testimony they possess. They testified about Christ, that Jesus truly is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He came and He died to pay for sins. And listen, you who know Christ, you who have truly come to Christ from the heart, you know that 
nothing compares with him. Maybe you've imagined the scenario. Someone comes to you and puts a gun to your head and says, will you deny Christ? I'll let you live. Have you thought that through? Have you assessed your own heart and your own life and come to the conclusion, whatever you might uh, fear about how going out of this life will be, the fact that Christ is better than life is the heart of the Christian. Have you come to grips with the call of the gospel? To die to yourself, to take up your cross and follow him means of following Christ into suffering. Martyrdom is a, a very real possibility for anyone who would name Christ if you found yourself in certain circumstances. Circumstances which we've been relatively free from in Western civilization. They are slaughtered because of the testimony they maintained. This is a prosecutable loyalty to Christ. We might ask ourselves, is is there enough to prosecute in my life? Would a watching world know my loyalty to Christ by the way that I live and the things that I say. Sir Walter Scott wrote this, the word of God, when faithfully declared in its incisive claims on man's conscience, ever stirs into action the hostility of the world. And its most most faithful exponents in life and public testimony often seal that witness with their blood. He's right. The word of God declared creates an offense in a hostile world. Ever since Christ left this earth, there have been martyrs who have sealed their testimony with their own blood. In the early church, it was the Christians under the Roman Empire. They were considered defectors from the Roman Empire. They were considered atheists and prosecutable by death. They were fed to lions. They were killed for sport in the arenas. The emperor Nero hoisted their bodies onto poles in his own garden and lit them on fire as entertainment for his garden parties. Early church history records many who died simply because they named Christ as Lord. You may have read Fox's Book of Martyrs that records many of the martyrs down through church history into the English Reformation. Maybe you subscribe to the magazine Voice of the Martyrs And you can read modern day, current martyrdoms of those who follow Christ in places where it's costly, dearly, to follow him. Being killed for being a Christian may seem a distant memory to us in America. But you need to know that the 20th century recorded more martyrdoms for Christ than all previous centuries combined. You go to other parts of the world where it's difficult to follow Christ, where it is deadly to be named a Christian, and there are many who have suffered. In the time of the tribulation, it will get much worse. What has been sporadic will be common. What has been remarkable in history will be an everyday occurrence. Walter Scott goes on to say, the Lord at present, by the power of the Holy Spirit on earth, bridles the passions of men, But let the presence and power of the Spirit be withdrawn and the world's enmity to Christ and to those who are His shall burst out in fierce and bitter persecution even unto death. Just consider this. When the world rejects God altogether and the salt of the earth is gone and the light of the world is gone and the restrainer is gone, it will be open season on those who claim loyalty to Christ. Hostility toward followers of Christ during the tribulation period will be unprecedented in its scope and the whole world will participate. Notice in verse 9, they are said to be underneath the altar. This is probably the altar, the golden altar of incense. Uh, We see this in chapter 8, verse 3. 
We read there, another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add to it the prayers of all the saints and the golden altar which was before the throne. You remember the scene from chapter 4, that altar of golden incense, or that golden altar of incense before the throne of God was filled with the incenses, the, the prayers of the saints from all the ages. And those prayers go up before God as a pleasing aroma, as a sacrifice, as a matter of worship. Remember that there is not a prayer a saint prays that is lost before God. They are actually a matter of worship before Him. The world may not see it, but it is precious in His sight. And these saints are said to be under that same altar. What is the indication there? It means their voices join with the voices of all of God's people from all time that are pleasing to the Lord, rising to His ear. Why do we describe them here in verse 9 as being home? This is a contrast to verse 10. Notice the last phrase of verse 10. Those who dwell on the earth. We'll look at this in a little more detail, but the ones who are souls beneath the altar in the presence of God, whose voices are pleasing to the Lord, joining with the prayers of all the saints, are different than the group called the earth dwellers. Now, they did dwell on the earth, but that was not their identity. They belong to Christ, and they are His, and they are home. You see, the earth was not their home. Their citizenship was in heaven. And so to see their souls under the altar is to see them in their place. This is like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.8, to be absent from the body is to actually be at home with the Lord. Here they are, absent from the body, at home with the Lord. They are now safe. They are, in fact, now more alive than they ever have been, having been killed. Consider these followers of Christ in this unique period of time. They're not part of the church era. They are tribulation saints. That is, they have come to faith in Christ during the period of Christ's judgment against the earth. That means they're relatively new believers at this point. This scene, according to Matthew 24, happens prior to the abomination of desolations. That is, prior to the midpoint of the tribulation. This is early on in the judgment of God in this seven-year period of time. And the earth has gone from having zero believers on the earth to having these, the first fruits. And we discover in Revelation chapter 13 that there are two witnesses, excuse me, Revelation 11, there are two witnesses who proclaim God's truth. And in Revelation chapter 7, 144,000 separated out Jewish evangelists that take the gospel. There will be believers during this time. In fact, an uncountable multitude from every nation and tribe and people and tongue, according to Revelation chapter 7, will believe during this time. In Matthew 24, 9, Jesus describes this scene in this time period. He says, they will deliver you over to tribulation and they will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine coming to faith in Jesus the Messiah during the worst period of human history, where doing so immediately puts you in the crosshairs of the hatred of every nation on the earth. There will be no time like that time. There will be more murder and more hatred, more death on all fronts than any other time in human history, and more martyrdoms. Throughout church's history, persecution has revealed the truth of profession. Do you know a semblance of this in your own life? Hardship squeezes so that you begin to see what's in the heart. Can you imagine what it was like in the first couple of centuries of following Christ in the Roman Empire, particularly under several Roman emperors who made it illegal on punishment of death to follow Christ? Would you have people walking around say, hey, it's pretty cool to be a Christian? 
Would you have people that rode the coattails of other people's professions and said, yeah, I'll go along with them. That sounds like fun. No, immediately there was a cost to following Christ. The take up your cross and follow me had some teeth to it. What did it mean to name Christ publicly? Well, it it may have meant very quickly you lost your job, lost your family, lost your social standing, lost any way to actually provide for yourself, to be destitute, maybe on the run. That will be lived out on a global scale during this tribulation period. In our day today, there are over a billion people who name the name of Christ, who call themselves Christians. What would immediate, worldwide persecution do to that profession? Persecution has a way of purifying profession. Well, these tribulation saints in verse 9 are home And in verse 10, we see them petitioning. They're petitioning. Verse 10 says, They cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They cry out here with a loud voice. This loud voice is not a complaint. It's not impatient. It's not sinful. These saints will never sin again. They are perfect, they are sinless here, they have lived their earthly life and they're done with it. Here they are in heaven and they cry out with a loud voice. We saw the cacophony of noises in Revelation 4 and 5 in this throne room scene. Holy, pleasing to God, a raucous noise. And here this loud voice cries out, it is this crowd of souls under the altar and they are speaking to God. In sinless petition, with emotion, totally in keeping with the values of heaven. How long, O Lord, will you refrain from judging and avenging? This may seem a strange sentiment to us. And in some sense, I hope it remains so as long as we are on the earth. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19.1, we read this. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. This doxology of praise from redeemed sinners. Notice the next verse. Because his judgments are true and righteous. Why? Because he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his slaves on her. And a second time they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the doxology continues. It's a remarkable scene that sinners who were actually guilty of sins on the earth after they're in heaven, rejoice with God's justice at punishing sinners who are on the earth. There seems to be strange discord in these sentiments. And I think that discord is appropriate. There is a time for us to weep and grieve and pray. And then there will be a time where we understand glory and the radiant brilliance of the justice of God and our hearts will resonate with that justice. The harlot in Revelation 19 is an emblem of that great anti-God system of the world combining its politics and its spirituality against God. And, and those who have been redeemed out of it, who were once part of it, they were part of the system, they've been extricated out of the system, and now they belong to God and His kingdom, and they rejoice at the glory of God in the destruction of that system. It's a strange sentiment. That system is populated by the mailman and the piano teacher and the neighbor and the 
colleagues. Jonathan Edwards wrote an entire sermon on why there will be no tears in heaven, why there will be no weeping or sorrow or sadness in heaven, when even now we think about those who are under the judgment of God and we weep. And he affirms that's appropriate. There is a weeping and a praying and a pleading now for us. And just know, take comfort, Christian, there will be a rejoicing then that is appropriate. I'm not sure we can understand that now. But we can trust that God has a place for that. These sinners who were saved during the tribulation, who will be saved during the tribulation, they now find themselves in heaven in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, and, and they are there resonating with the glory that is due to God alone. And they say, How long, O Lord, will you refrain from judging? And this refrain occurs throughout Scripture. Psalm 74, 10, the psalmist says, How long, O God, will the adversary revile and the enemy spurn your name? Behind this how long, O Lord, question, this petition is a heart that beats for the vindication of God and His glory and His name. How long will the earth live in rebellion? How long will the creatures revile their Creator? O God, will you be glorified? Will you put an end to the rebellion? Will you get the glory that you are due? That is the heartbeat here. The word for Lord in verse 10 is not the usual word for Lord in the New Testament. It is the word despot. It's where we get our English word despot. It is a, an absolute master or owner. Here, the idea is that God is the absolute owner and master of all things. And the appeal is, God, do with yours what is right. The universe is yours. The world is yours. The whole world of humanity is yours. Make it right, O God. And notice the appeal, God, master, holy, and true. If God is holy, set apart, unique, including being set apart from sin, and if he is true, then he can't hold back judgment forever. He would cease to be just, he would cease to be good, he would cease to be true, he would cease to be holy if he allowed sin and rebellion into eternity. God is very patient. He's been patient a long time. He's been long-suffering and merciful, not giving us according to what we deserve. But there is a day when mercy runs out. God's holiness and His trueness are fundamental characteristics of who He is. Those who would be tempted in their heart to say, well, my God would never fill in the blank. If you contravene what God says about himself and what he will do, when you express such sentiments, you're not talking about the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible will do as he has said. The book of Revelation is his own self-disclosure. God is warning us on the earth exactly what he will do. The soul's cry out, how long will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood? This is reminiscent of Psalm 79.10. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our sight vengeance for the blood of your servants which has been shed. This is an appeal that identifies God's character and His name and His purpose with His people. If the one true God has people on the earth and those people and the truths they testify to are always and forever maligned, what does that say about God? His character, His power, His identity, His promises, His loyalty to His own people. Who would worship a God who let His people lose all the time? God's own vindication is at stake in the rescue of His people and the vindication of his name. And they cry out, how long will you refrain from avenging our blood from those who dwell on the earth? And he either means those who dwell on the earth exacted our blood, they shed our blood, um, or 
that God is going to avenge their blood from those who dwell on the earth. Either way you take this phrase, this is a description of God having his day and those who persecuted those who love Christ will meet God in judgment. This last phrase at the end of verse 10, those who dwell on the earth, the earth dwellers, this is used eight times in the book of Revelation. It is a technical term, a description for the unrepentant world. There are lots of people who happen to be on the earth during this time, but the earth dwellers is a description of those who will not repent, those who do not turn, those who become the objects of God's judgment during the tribulation period. They are different than those who are living on the earth at the time who are called saints, the elect, the beloved, the children of God. And this phrase, the earth dwellers, is descriptive. It describes those who have no home but earth. This is the only place that is home for them. It describes a people who want no home but earth. They are earthy or earthly or worldly. This is their home. This is where they belong in their own minds. This, they put all their eggs in the basket of this life. Listen to Paul's assessment of people like this in his own day in Philippians chapter 3. Paul encourages the followers of Christ to follow Paul's example. And then he describes people who claim to be Christians but live like earth dwellers. Verse 18, he says, I now tell you, weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. They don't want to have anything to do with cross talk. Take up your cross and follow me. If you're going to follow Jesus, you have to suffer. You're not going to experience a life of temporal ease and blessing. Following Christ is costly. And they're enemies of all of those ideas. In fact, the people Paul is talking about are, are people who call themselves Christians and promise you can have your cake and eat it too. You can live like the world and still name Christ and you'll be okay. And Paul says no. Their end, verse 9, is destruction. Their God is their appetite. Their glory is in their shame. They set their minds on earthly things. They're trying to live their best life now. They're driven by temporal impulses. Their home is here. And by contrast, in Philippians 3.20, Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly await our Savior. These souls in heaven, thirdly, in verse 11, are rewarded. Notice what John sees. There was given to each of them a white robe. What are these martyrs wearing? Uh, they are clothed in a white robe. The white robe described here is a long flowing robe of state. Uh, it reaches to the feet and it, it described the dignity of those who held a, a high position in government. It was given to each of them. That is, this is a grace gift. And throughout the book of Revelation, the, the white robes depict purity and holiness and divine approval. This is a grace gift of holiness from God to these beloved ones. It is a robe of righteousness. A robe of righteousness both declared and produced. In fact, in the book of Revelation and in the New Testament, the white robes given to saints are symbolic of the righteousness of Christ. In other words, you can't get into heaven without it. Do you remember Jesus' parable of the wedding clothes? You try to show up to heaven not clothed in the righteousness of Christ, you're in trouble. You don't get to be there. And the white robes depict the righteous deeds of the saint, of the saints. Revelation 19.8. Those who are with Christ in heaven are given white robes. They are called the righteous acts of the saints. What does that mean? Both of these are grace gifts. To, to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ by which we are justified, and then by grace to walk in the good deeds which God prepared in advance for us to walk. 
then both of these things become a reward. It's the reward of faith and the reward of faithfulness, evident as a garment in heaven. These saints are home, they are petitioning, they are rewarded, and finally they are waiting. They are waiting. Look at the rest of verse 11. And they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow slaves and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. They're waiting. They're given encouragement here to rest. They were told they should rest for a little while longer. Uh, This little while is a designation of a short period of time. This isn't a description of of all the martyrs from all of church ages. These are particular to these martyrs. They are home, they are safe, and they are told here to rest, to enjoy the rest that has been purchased for them. It is a rest from struggle and hardship. It is the rest from being hunted down and killed. They're home. They are safe. The struggle is over. The command here to rest is a command to enjoy the beauty and the blessing of God's presence, having just been rescued out of the worst period of human history. And they were told to rest for a little while longer. What is this little while? What is God up to? What what is God going to accomplish as these martyrs wait? I believe two groups of people are described here, fellow slaves, and brethren to be killed. Uh, Some see these as the same group. Um, That that may be true. I I think these are probably two groups. And their fellow slaves would be others during the time period of the tribulation who come to faith in Jesus Christ. And then the second group would be those who come to faith in Jesus Christ and then are killed just as they had been killed. I don't know what it would be like to become a Christian during that time to maybe read the book of Revelation and figure out, oh, there's a set number of martyrs. There's something comforting in that. Maybe something intimidating. Might I be killed for Christ? But something comforting in the fact that none of this is out of the Lord's control. God has a set number of people whom he loves who will be killed for their testimony of Christ. To be killed for Christ is not to be removed from his love. You understand that from the end of Romans 8. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? We're being put to slaughter all day long. Shall sword, death, persecution, famine, nakedness, can any of that separate us from the love of God in Christ? No. This company who will be faithful during this awful period of time, will be under the banner of God's love, His purpose, His plan, His protection, even in and through death. Do you understand that no matter how you go home, Christian, it is a safe trip home? This is how the Bible describes it. Paul, who is likely beheaded at the hand of Nero, the Roman emperor, described his own home-going as a safe journey. This is God's perspective. There will be repentance and faith for more who will believe by the sovereign grace of God. And there will be the murder of those who will be martyred by the sovereign grace of God. Until when? According to this verse, until the last believer is in and the last martyr is killed. And they will join the long line from Stephen and the apostles to Polycarp, the very disciple of John who wrote this revelation, who was killed. And he said, 80 and six years I have served my Savior. They tried to get him to recant. They said, if you disbelieve Jesus, we'll let you go free. And he said, he's never done me wrong. How could I deny him now? And they killed him. To all those murdered under the Roman Empire through the reformers and the missionaries to martyrs in our own present day. They are precious sacrifices in the sight of God and finally home. These tribulation martyrs will join honored ranks. 
Every suffering saint is in God's hand. Every evildoer who murders one of his own is responsible. You might ask, why is a story about martyrs a seal judgment? How is this opening of the fifth seal, the revealing of the souls of martyrs, a judgment against a rebellious world? I think this is an ominous, terrifying judgment. To have the windows of heaven opened and for us to be able to see that those who are killed for their faithfulness to Christ are precious to God. It's not good to harm what God deems precious. You might have to go back to the 1980s a little bit with me for a moment. At least for me, it was in the 1980s that we collected baseball cards. It seemed like every kid had baseball cards. And you were looking for rookie cards and you were looking for valuable cards. We all had these little newspaper books that described the value of various baseball cards. And we traded them, we sold them, we saved up allowances and went down to the Circle K and bought a pack hoping that some special baseball card was in there. And then a lot of guys had a little brother who, who would go through the baseball card collection and, and pick one out at random. Of course, he picked out the most valuable rookie card that you had that was encased in glass, pulls it out, and he stuck it between the spokes of his BMX bicycle. And, and the bike would go around, and every time that card went, went by the spokes, it would make this fluttering sound that, that imitated a motorcycle exhaust pipe, and it sounded really cool. And you're, you're thinking, where, where, where did my baseball card go? Somebody's little brother's got it, flapping between the spokes of the BMX bike, ruining the card. Don't touch my stuff. How does God feel when his precious ones, blood-bought, are hunted down and killed by those who hate what is good? The death of the saints is precious in his sight. And the death of martyrs who maintained prosecutable fidelity to Christ in the face of the cost of their own lives is precious to the Lord. And this scene highlights that very thing. They are under the altar of incense. Their very lives are wafting up as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And their voices are joined together pleading, how long, O Lord, till you judge? Do you not think the Lord will hear those voices and even be provoked in his anger against the world. He has a purpose for their suffering. One of the purposes for their suffering is that their blood would call God's special attention. Do you remember the opening scenes and the first murder of a righteous one? Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him, Genesis 4, 8 says. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Do you hear God's heart in this? What about an army of witnesses during the tribulation period whose blood cries out to the Lord from the ground? What will he do? These persecuted martyrs, precious to God, offer up the question, how long, O Lord, holy and true? Their sinless inquiry provokes the holy and true wrath of God against their persecutors. This seal judgment depicts the ominous, impending doom on the unbelieving world as the pleas of the souls of the martyred are heard at the altar of God in the throne room of heaven. This is bad news for those who dwell on the earth. Jesus himself said in Luke 18, Will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will bring about justice for them quickly. Paul encourages believers who are persecuted in 2 Thessalonians 1. 
It is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. In Acts 17, Paul said that Jesus appointed a man, the man Christ Jesus, one day to judge the earth in this way. This is a view into heaven, into the future of souls of those who die for Christ during the tribulation. Let's walk back through these four categories, these four headings, and just test drive our hearts a little bit. They're home, or they will be. Where is your home? Where do you belong? Search your heart this morning. Where is your citizenship? Does Philippians 3.20 describe you? Is it evident by a prosecutable loyalty to Christ? Is it evident when things rust or are stolen? Are you an earth dweller? Are you one whose loyalties and identities belong to this world, subject to God's judgment? Listen, if you have not counted the Christian life as a loss of self and a death of self, you have not yet come to Christ. Listen, and it's a good death. To to lose the world and gain Christ is everything. What would it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Crosses are familiar in our day. They're parts of architecture and jewelry. But when Jesus said this, the the Romans were known for hanging people up on beams in the middle of town and leaving them there until they died an excruciating death. It was awful and bloody, horrific. And here, Jesus the Messiah inviting people, hey, come follow me. Follow my lifestyle. Do what I do. Walk in my steps. I'm going to a cross. This was a call to a kind of discipleship that demanded at the front end a self-death. A dying to self. And of course, this is the picture throughout the Christian life. Paul writes in Galatians 6, May it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The fundamental task of sanctification, of of growing in Christ, is, is something of a death to self. Paul calls it in Romans 8.13, the putting to death the deeds of the body. There are parts of me that are still displeasing to the Lord and they need to die. There is a mortal combat going on inside me. It means things that I naturally love have to go away. Think about the task of being a husband in a marriage, according to Ephesians 5. You husbands, love your wives the way Christ loved the church does not mean only have affections for her when she can give you something in return and she's as beautiful as the day you married her. It actually means death to self. How did Christ love the church? He died for her, gave gave himself up for her. The Christian life is a one of self-denial and of dying to self, of living for Christ following his example. Think about this petition the martyred souls make in verse 10. What are you praying for? When you go before the throne of grace, what's on your heart there? There are some things that are the same that we might cry out here and, and some things that are radically different from them, at least for now. Of course, we would pray for the vindication of God 
How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging? We actually are commanded by Jesus to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. That is a prayer for God to have his day, for God to have his way, for God to vindicate his own name. But, but what of the second half of their petition? Avenge our blood. That's not our prayer yet. These are not marching orders for us. This is a, a record of what future saints will do who are in heaven. Our marching orders are different for now. Love your enemies, Jesus said. Pray for those who persecute you. Turn to Romans chapter 12. We ought to be marked by this disposition. Verse 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved. That word beloved in there just sort of strikes the heart, doesn't it? Remember, you're loved by God. Don't take vengeance. Leave room for the wrath. Notice in that verse, the of God phrase is supplied for you in English to help smooth out the translation. It's not there in the original. The original is just stark and stunning. Don't take revenge, leave room for the wrath. How much space do you have to reserve for God's wrath against a sinful world? All of it. We don't take an ounce of vengeance or revenge. We love those who hate us. We pray for those who persecute us. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men, and you leave room for the wrath, beloved. That's a challenge to us. We, we want a pound of flesh. We, we, we want injustices to be made right now. But if you leave room for the wrath of God, if you assess this correctly, if you understand what it means that the infinite God of the universe will exact justice from every evil deed that is not paid for by the blood of Christ, we stand back and we say, whoa. We might even be provoked more to pray for those who sin against us. This is the example Jesus left. Look at Luke 23. This same Jesus, who is the one pouring out wrath in the day of judgment, when he was here absorbing the wrath of his father, hanging on a cross, he says in verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. As he's being crucified, he petitions his father to forgive the sinners. The same sentiment is repeated in the first martyr, Acts chapter 7. Of course, he's not the first in world history to die in faithfulness to God, but he's the first in the church era. This is Stephen. And they didn't want him talking about Christ, and he couldn't stop talking about Christ, and they threw rocks at him until he died. Verse 59, they went on stoning Stephen as he called out on the Lord and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, 11 to 13 says, we're the scum of the earth, we're persecuted and we do not pay back. This perspective is appropriate to now. Take comfort, there's another perspective that's appropriate to then. Jesus, when he walked into rebellious Jerusalem, he wept. Oh, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you as a hen gathers its chicks, to protect, to love, to care for. There's a day coming when Jesus will judge all those who don't believe the gospel. 
And until that day, there goes the plea. Turn, believe, pray for enemies. Don't take vengeance. As we look at what the saints, the martyred saints of the tribulation are wearing in Revelation chapter six, they they are clothed in white robes. I would just ask you this morning, what are you wearing? Are you clothed in the righteousness of Christ? Have you received by his grace the righteousness you could never produce, but he gives as a free gift to all who would believe? And are you walking in the grace that produces a righteousness that God will reward? Ephesians 2.10 talks about the grace of God, which then causes us to walk in the righteous deeds that God himself produces. Is that your life? Will you be found in white robes when you meet Christ? And these souls in Revelation 6 were waiting. I would ask you, what are you waiting for? They were waiting for the rest to come in. Fellow slaves who would believe, fellow martyrs who would be killed, even as they were. Do you see your life that way? A different era of history, sure. But is your life built around seeing the world around you filled with people who don't yet know Christ? Who will I meet today that needs to hear about Christ? Who can I talk to about the gospel? Who can I usher into eternal life by telling them about our King and our Redeemer? And there will be those who suffer. Even those who will be killed for fidelity to Christ. Maybe in this room. Maybe among missionaries we send. Maybe in children we raise and train up. Turn to Luke chapter 2. Excuse me, Luke chapter 12. This idea of rest a little longer until the fullness comes in. I guarantee you they're not bored, those souls in heaven in the presence of Christ. And a life of waiting on Christ's return here is not a life of boredom. When we talk about waiting on Christ, we, we mean a Luke twelve thirty five sense of waiting. That is, being busy about the master's business and anticipating the master's return. This is the Christian life. Listen to Jesus' words in Luke 12, 35. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. What are they doing while they're waiting? Verse 37, blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will gird himself to serve. He will have them recline at the table. He will come and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second or the third watch, if he finds them so, blessed are those slaves. The slaves waiting on the master's return are waiting in faithfulness and readiness. They are serving him. In the next parable, Jesus describes a homeowner Wait like a homeowner who knows when the thief is coming. Uh, You don't know when the thief is coming, so be ready all the time. You don't know when the Son of Man is coming. And the last parable Jesus gives is the parable about the faithful steward. What is the faithful steward doing as he's waiting for the Lord? Serving him. Serving him faithfully about his master's business ready for his return. Christian, how's your heart this morning? Where's your home? What do you pray about? What do you anticipate? How are you living life in anticipation of the Lord's return? In what are you clothed? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the righteousness that you provide by your grace that covers our sin. 
You've exchanged our filthy rags for your brilliant holiness. And you have given as a gift your grace, which not only forgives, but also transforms. You have left us here in this life to not have everything comfortable, to not have all the the prosperity and the dreams that the world around us goes after. Lord, this is not our home. You have left us here to be your slaves, to be ambassadors of your message, to be those who would proclaim your coming kingdom. You have invited us to follow you, and in this life it may not be a primrose path. You have invited us to take up crosses, to deny ourselves, and to follow you. Lord Jesus, we love you so imperfectly. We believe you so poorly, and yet we cling to you. We have nowhere else to turn but to you. And we thank you that you do not leave us alone in this path, that even as we take up crosses to follow you, you are with us to the end of the age. In your name we pray. Amen.